Um, these are my girls. And it was 80s dress down day. This is not the uniform of the school. And they would absolutely kill me if they knew I was bringing this picture into you. Um, these girls have been with me since they enrolled in the inaugural year of Psy Academy, which is a small charter school in New Orleans East. Um, many of you probably remember Hurricane Katrina and the people standing on rooftops screaming for help that didn't come. Yeah, that's, that's the Ninth Ward. Our school is housed in trailers. We call them modulars, though. We are currently the top performing school in the district, only beaten by the selective enrollment charter schools, and we are comfortably housed in our modulars. Um, it seems like a moment ago since those girls were just freshmen, and now I sit with them and I help them apply for college applications, and I think about how far I've come with them, and how far we as a school have come with them, and also all the innovation and all of the successes and failures that we've taken along the way. Um, so for me, Psy Academy began in a small, darkly lit bar in the French Quarter. <laughs> Sorry. I was there to meet a man named Ben Markovitz, um, and at the time I was a first year teacher. I was still glittering with those last remnants of idealism uh, that had brought me back from Japan, and I was currently working in the second worst school in the entire district. Um, I say last remnants because that idealism was very rapidly becoming feelings that alarmed me, these feelings of bitterness and of dismay. Um, that year, my first as a teacher in the United States, I had been slammed into a wall and had a concussion. My wallet had been stolen twice. My bike had been destroyed in broad daylight uh, by what must have been a crowbar. And I guess the coup de grace was a student threatened to shoot me in the face for the F he'd received and two days later was caught bringing a gun onto campus. Um, high stakes position and feeling constantly like a failure. For example, I taught Mabel. Mabel watched her grandmother die on the steps of the Superdome two days after Katrina. Uh, Mabel went to go find help and was separated from her brother and only family and did not see him for months later as she was sent to a different state. Mabel cannot read. Mabel cannot write. Mabel wanted desperately to tell her story. So we spent a large part of the winter and the early spring transcribing her story in this beat-up notebook she carried around everywhere with her. Um, over spring break, Mabel became pregnant and dropped out. I've not seen her since. Um, so it was about that time I began thinking this whole teaching thing, not for me. Um, it, it just felt insurmountable, right? The rules are always changing. The kids are swallowed in a roar of poverty, inconsistency, illiteracy, high stakes testing, failure, truancy, and honestly, teachers like me, completely ill-equipped to meet the needs of these kids. So I'm sitting in that bar ordering my second glass of wine and going on about everything being wrong except the kids. They deserve so much more. Fortunately, Ben saw something in me besides my obvious ignorance, and he invited me to join the founding staff of his school. So to paint a picture of what the educational landscape in New Orleans looked like at the time, it's kind of like a chess game, but with 17 people playing, and everybody gets to play at once. So in 2005, the Louisiana Department of Education decided to take over New Orleans schools because 107 of the 117 of them were failing. Of course, Hurricane Katrina hits that summer. All of the public school teachers are summarily fired, and rebuilding the educational system just kind of went to the bottom of a huge pile. And amongst the rubble, charter schools began popping up here and there. Um, to recruit kids to his school and our school, Ben Markovitz actually went door to door. He sat in living rooms and he made a promise. I promise to prepare all scholars for college success, equip with the passion and tools to begin innovative and world-changing pursuits. All scholars, regardless of background, home, socioeconomic level, all scholars. Tall order, right? But 100 families took a chance on us. They signed their ninth graders up with the school with no building, eight staff members, and no curriculum. They signed up to us based on a promise. And we all believed in that promise. But we quickly discovered that belief was not enough. Looking back on those few months, I actually marvel at my own naivety. How could I have thought, after a year of teaching Mabel, that my kids would be reading Lord of the Flies by December? But I believed that my high expectations and hard work would get them where they need to be. Ben gave me a thumbs up and said, go on ahead. And I'm sure you're already thinking about the punchline to this. Um, but looking back, I, I mean, 
I can apologize, but I can also say I had the best of intentions. Like, what did I know about preparing all scholars for college success and world-changing pursuits? I wanted for them what I wanted about my own high school experience, right? Engaging literature, high-level conversations. I wanted for them that high-quality education that I and my colleagues had received. So let's flash forward to November. I am struggling through Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. And our students are culturally aligned. They responded really, really beautifully to the discipline system that we set up for them. They loved the structure. They loved being loved by their teachers. And every time I asked a question, they would say, may I please have some help? Um, which is a phrase that I taught them. And of course I could help. But what I was finding is that without my help, they weren't retaining the material. And worse yet, they couldn't read it. So seriously, how does one discuss symbolism when they read at a second grade level? How do you love the written word when it's caused you nothing but frustration and awkwardness and embarrassment your entire school career? How do you even read the words equipped for world-changing pursuits without phonics instruction? How do you visualize a meadow when the closest you've seen to one is a vacant lot? These kids took a chance on us, and now we needed to take a chance, too. That meant actually going off the proverbial map, educationally speaking, and going into new territory. It also meant scrapping weeks and weeks and weeks of my time. Um, it also meant the knowledge that we could not simply replicate the high quality education that we had received. We had to create a new kind of education, one that truly met the definition of all scholars. So we brought in some advisors, and with their help, we built this little zygote of a data-driven instructional plan. We gave everybody a test. Ah, you read on average of fourth grade level. No wonder Shirley Jackson is a little difficult. Um, set up some benchmark assessments to go over um, and check the progress along the way. And I spent my entire winter break stickering books and creating differentiated groupings and planning a phonics instruction from scratch and mostly getting my head around the idea of quantity. They just needed to read a lot of books. They needed to talk about them and write about them and spit about them and say, I didn't like this one or I like this one and throw it down and pick up a new book and start all over again. It didn't really matter what they were reading. They just needed to read. And it was about this time that I started having conversations with kids like Robert. Uh, Robert, when asked to choose a book, chose Lord of the Rings, biggest book on the shelf. Robert, though, reading at a fourth grade level, was not going to be able to access that book. So I pulled him aside and I handed him Harry Potter. And I was like, maybe you like this one. Miss Eckhart, it's a baby book. So we got this Whole Foods bag and put a cover on that baby book and wrote Lord of the Rings on the front. And I said, <laughs> give it a chance. Just trust me and give it a chance. And he did. And he kept taking that cover and wrapping it on the next Harry Potter book and the next one until he made it all the way through. And by the way, this year, Robert read Lord of the Rings. And we did. We read piles and piles of books. And they weren't the books that I read in high school. They weren't. But they were books. And they howled when Night John got his toes chopped off for teaching other slaves to read. And they cried when Dallas and the Outsiders died. And they got into homogeneous groups. And they argued about where the red fern grows and the lovely bones. And every time, they'd say, Miss Eckhart, this is a baby book. I know it's on my level, but really? I just kind of repeat my mantra. You need to give this a chance. You need to try. All the while knowing that. I was given it a chance to. I had no clue if whether this was going to work. But I had to be willing to try. So that, that uh, spring, our trailer like, shook with noise. One kid actually jumped so hard that she fell through our prefab floor. <laughs> um, our school had taken number one in the district in both English and math. Brand new school. Uh, we assessed the kids at the end of the year. And they had grown 3.5 years in reading since December. Um, we rejoiced, and we celebrated, and we patted each other on the back. But that's not the end. That's the beginning. We put a Band-Aid on this really, really impossible situation. And we'd made ourselves proud. But let's keep in mind, Robert Thomas grew four years. But he's still only reading at the eighth grade level, and he's 17. Our average reading level for the class was still only uh, seventh grade-ish. Most importantly, we didn't want them ready to just pass tests. We wanted them ready for those world-changing pursuits. So over the next three years, we tried a number of different things. Um, some of them were great successes, and some of them failed miserably. We stood on chairs to talk about omniscient. We chanted, huh, whoa, next click, to talk about reading strategies. I taught the reluctant reader group about Rwanda to discuss bias. 
Um, and most importantly, I swallowed my own preconceived notion about what it meant to be a teacher and what it meant to be a reader. Readers don't read because they're forced to read. Readers read because they love to read. They read what enriches them and interests them as people. And what I wanted for them is to love the written word. Being innovative doesn't mean having the most creative idea. It doesn't mean having like the biggest or the best idea. Being innovative means coming up with an idea that meets the needs of the moment. There's my needs. Even when that need and that plan seem foolhardy, even when it seems ridiculous, innovation means being willing to take a chance when no one else around you is considering it. When I arrived in New Orleans to be a teacher, no one was taking a chance on the population that my school serves. It was, and still is, commonly assumed that ninth grade is too late, and the focus of education should be on getting them on level early and keeping them there, and I get that, but in my mind, ninth grade is not too late. These children deserve a high quality, free education. They deserve teachers who love them and care about them and who will fight for them and work very, very hard for them. I cannot stand here today and tell you that we're 100% successful. That would be a total lie. Our seniors, as I speak, are applying to colleges. Um, most of them, though, will go to state schools. Um, many of them will have to take remedial courses. They struggle to push their ACT past 20, and honestly, they don't write very well yet because their biggest obstacle is still reading. Let's not forget, this class was the original experiment. They are the children that we, with the best of intentions, experimented on. This class of seniors doesn't love the written word the way my students do now, because I've learned and innovated along the way. They read because we ask them to, but they don't read because they love it. This is heartbreaking. I suppose the most deeply troubling aspect, then, of innovation is that there are crushing failures along the way. And when your test subjects are children, crushing isn't even the word. Several children come to mind when I think of the children that I have failed. One of them is Tehran. I love this picture of Tehran. He's just this cool kid. Um, he's a whirlwind of ADHD and bad gang tattoos. Um, he joined us in 2008 and was summarily expelled for selling drugs on campus. He joined us in 2010, still reading at a second grade level, still a freshman, and then dropped out. He joined us this year, age 19, still reading at a second grade level, um, and was expelled for egregious violence but we wrote into his contract that he will be able to come back and he'll be in my classroom again in January and the innovation will begin again. So what is it gonna take to make Toronto a reader? What is it going to take to make him and his classmates and all scholars prepared for the world outside of their neighborhoods, outside of what is familiar and onto college campuses? What is it that we've not thought of yet? And that's it right there really that keeps me inspired. What is it that we've not thought of yet? What is it gonna take for Chelsea and Akimiana and Daytona and Jernique? Doing what people say can't be done means taking a chance. And anything that we do in this world means taking a chance. I see that chance every time I look out across my classroom. Each one of my kids comes with a story and that story is most often troubling. These kids come from the worst neighborhoods and the worst history. They come from the rubble that remains of Hurricane Katrina from families torn apart and communities and neighborhoods destroyed. They come from a city that has abandoned and ignored them. And now they come on their various paths to me. That feeling is daunting and humbling. I know the opportunities that these children have been afforded have been grossly inequitable. And we are all called to try. And sometimes if I think about it really hard, I'm really afraid. I as a teacher, we as a school, and we, as an educational community, are so far from where we need to be. We can always do more and think more and push more and innovate and everything can and will come crashing down. At least one child in every one of my classes is gonna break my heart. And this is true with anything we believe in enough to forge a new way. It takes sacrifice and unfulfilled promises and disappointments and moments of great fear. But to pause or to hesitate or to forget to innovate because of that fear, that's the only moment that we will fail. Thank you.